I'm Kathy Oler. Um, I'm half of this duo. Uh, for the last many years, I have worked as an autism consultant for a large urban school district in Indianapolis. I also was an assistive technology coordinator, and I'm also a speech language pathologist. Yeah. I'm Cheryl Boucher and I'm an occupational therapist. I also went ahead and got my master's in special education so that I could better support my teachers and families working in schools. I've worked in the school systems for over 20 years. Um, I love it. It's awesome. It's fun. Um, and then I also had done some uh, pediatric outpatient clinic with a lot of sensory processing issues in kiddos for several evenings a week. I gave that up a few years ago. And I always share that I have a nephew whose name is Casey who lives in Michigan and Casey just turned 20 and he has autism and so he is my kind of my guiding light. He is, you know, what would I want Casey to have? What, what, how would I want it to be for Casey? And he's made some phenomenal progress. He's just such a neat guy. Um, in Michigan, you can go to school through the age of 26 or until 26. So he's in a great program of half day of work and half day of still having classes and learning. It's just so neat to see the continued growth. So, um, but at any rate, we're excited that you're here today. I'm sorry that you weren't able to join us for our, our all day session. Um, and I think you want to do a little demographics of who we're, yeah, who yeah, we're speaking with. To. Okay. So can we just get an idea of uh, how many of you are students? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. How many are new teachers teaching right now? Yes. How many are seasoned teachers? Or, or Kathy and I are like seasoned, if you're more young seasoned. and you've had more than a couple of years of, <laughs> of work. So that's great. Um, any speech therapist? Any OTs? Okay, okay. Any, did I miss anybody? Counselors, psychologist, counselor? Great. Um, any regular gen ed teachers? Okay. Good. Nice. Welcome. Uh, psychologist? Okay. I think we got everybody. Uh, how many of you intend to work primarily with kids at the elementary level, like um, K through mm -hmm. 5 or something like that? And is there anybody in here then that intends to work primarily with secondary students? A few. Okay. okay. We're going to talk about both. We're going to talk about elementary and secondary. Have any of you already done your student teaching? You're doing it right now? OK, of those of you who have had some classroom experience, how many of you have interacted with or met a student who hates to write? OK, if you haven't, you will soon. <laughs> All right. There are so many kids in our schools that struggle with writing. And I'm not just talking about with making pretty letters and everything. I'm not just talking about the um, battle on whether we should use cursive or manuscript. Both of those are important things, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the kids that we work with who really struggle with the writing process, with getting information from here in the brain to here, something that we as educators can see what they know, can see what they know. Lots and lots of our students, especially those with executive function learning differences, and I'll tell you what that is in just a minute, lots of our students struggle with this writing process, and it really, really affects their academic achievement and their behavior. Some of those kids um, will have labels, like autism and, and uh, specific learning disability, labels like that. Some of the kids with executive function learning differences won't have labels, won't have official labels. They end up getting labels like lazy, unmotivated, non-compliant. But it's really, really important for all of you to know that the label doesn't matter. What does matter is how these students with learning differences learn and how they learn differently from the rest of their classmates. And what you as teachers, what we as teachers, can do to help these people be successful. Okay, Cheryl and I have mentioned the term executive function several times so far. And I told you I'd tell you what it is. 
it's a big area. We, we do an all-day workshop on executive function. Elisa, who introduced us, does an all-day workshop on, on executive function. It's a big area. But I'm going to give you the shortest definition for executive function than you will, that you will ever, ever hear. And let me tell you, if you have a test in one of your classes on executive function, memorize your teacher's definition for it, because mine is really a down and dirty one, and it probably won't get you as many points as you need on your test. Okay. But essentially, executive function is how the brain takes in information, organizes it and remembers it, and does something with it. Shortest definition you'll ever hear. Please go ahead and learn all the other parts of it that your teacher is going to teach you in your classes. But some examples of executive function learning differences are autism. Learning disability. Those are a couple of the examples. There's a specialist, um, uh, Barkley is his last name, who is a specialist in ADHD. And he says that ADHD was really um, misidentified as far as the name goes. It should have been called executive function disorder. Um, attention deficit disorder does not give it its all-encompassing what is really going on. I would add one word to it and say to remember that that is the CEO of your brain. It is the president of your brain. And I want my president to be really knowing what he's doing in order to do it all well. It's essentially this part of the brain. The, the whole brain is involved in executive function, but this frontal lobe is the most important part of it. That's the part that makes decisions. That's the part that organizes. That's the part that does language. It does all of the most important stuff. Well, I suppose breathing and heartbeat are pretty important too, and those are back there. But, but all the decision, the, um, the higher level thinking skills are part of executive function. And when you get your classroom of students, you're going to have lots and lots of students in your classroom who have executive function learning differences. Lots of them. And lots of them are not going to have any kind of IEP or any kind of special ed support, but they're still going to need for you to teach in a way that meets their needs. There are ways that you as teachers through your whole career can teach in a diversified manner, without driving yourselves crazy, to set students up for success. And we're going to talk about some of those, but I want to talk about the behavior thing first. Yep, go for it. Okay, I may say this part. This is my soapbox. Lots of kids with executive function learning differences and writing differences get treated as behavior problems. Because the way it manifests in the classroom lots of time is a refusal to write. Writing is so challenging for a lot of these kids with executive function learning differences that they can't or won't write anything. They can't or won't get started on their work. And what happens so often is that the response to that is to set up consequences. You know, if this kid doesn't do his work, then he gets a red card. Or if this kid doesn't do his work, he gets an F. I can't tell you how many times at the high school level I've sat around a case conference table. That's when a kid has an IEP. Sat around a case conference table where somebody at the table have, has said, you know, this student is really intelligent. This student has great ideas. But I'm afraid this kid is not going to graduate. He's not going to graduate with a diploma because he never does his work. Okay, it's usually said with anger like that. Okay, I learned as an autism consultant to dig a little bit deeper. What does that mean he doesn't do his work? Well, let me see. And then the teachers will start talking. And one teacher will say, well, I'm his high school English teacher. And we did Romeo and Juliet. And you know, he took part in the play. And he read the, he read the stuff. I saw him reading it. I know he did. He participated in class discussions. But you know what? He refused to write that book report. And then the US history teacher will say, well, you know, our whole grade, this, this grading period, was determined, was built on the research paper that kids did. And he picked a good topic, a topic he was interested in, and I saw him do his research, and he talked to me about his research, and I saw his outline, 
And then he refused to write the research paper. He never even wrote it. And the chemistry teacher will say, you know, he's my best lab student. But to get him to write up a lab report, he just won't do it. So I give him a zero on everything. What's the common denominator in all of those things? Writing. Mm -hmm. If a student can't or won't write, we as teachers can't see what they know. That's what their grades depend on after about second grade. Up till the middle of second grade, kids can tell us what they know through oral report. And we can, you know, check it off. This student has, has accomplished this lesson that I've been trying to teach. But after the middle of second grade, we expect kids to write things down, either through worksheets or through their homework or through tests. If they can't or won't write, we can't measure what they know. And the consequence is either a bad grade or a zero or a consequence, a punishment. We need to change that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's, it's when you look at your students and you don't see that right away and you're trying to figure out what, what's going on here, what is happening, and how can I best help? Where do I even start? And when you look at executive functioning and you look at, I have to be able to prioritize, to analyze, to have sequential thought. I have to be able to have attention and focus. My memory, my regulation center, all my emotional regulation, all of those things go into executive functioning. And so when I start to look at these pieces and say, okay, there's a lot going on here, and how can I best be able to support that student? Um, Kathy and I found that we started looking at under four lenses of what, how we might be able to support those students and look at them all inclusively. Um, and so wanting to make sure that we look at the four lenses of language, organization, sensory, and motor. So I'll say it again, language, organization, sensory, and motor. If you're going to write anything down today, write that down. Because right. those are four ways of looking at kids who struggle with this writing process. Right. And because as we're talking about executive functioning, and we also look at all the subsets of all the things you have to do when you are writing. And when you think about that, you have to be able to have, you know, from an OT perspective, I can say you've got to have good eye-hand coordination. You've got to have good visual motor skills, right? I've got to be able to have good language skills. I've got to receptively be able to receive what the instructor is telling me to do. And I have to be able to express myself in some way when I'm trying to do writing. Um, I've got to be able to have good core strength to hold my body up against gravity to sit and hold my paper and to be able to write. One hand is dominant, one hand is recessive. Um, I have to be able to cross the midline of my body as I write. Things that I'm sure as student teachers you probably haven't thought of, but I tell you there's a wonderful pyramid that talks about up here at the top of being a great writer, that down here at the bottom we have to have all this foundational skills in order to get to the top of the pyramid. And so there's so much sub-pieces of the writing process from knowing where my body is in space to having good visual perceptual skills. Um, what else I'm leaving out? Probably a couple, but there's a a huge subset. So I've got all those pieces there. So then if I go back to those four lenses and say language, organization, motor, and sensory, if I put in some good strategies in each of those areas, I'm going to help all these subsets of the writing process and support those executive functioning skills. Yeah. And okay, so what do we do? What does that mean to look at language, organization, sensory, and motor? I'm a speech pathologist, so when I received a referral for a student who struggled with the writing process, I tended to provide supports in language and or organization. And that did a pretty good job. That wasn't bad. Those are both important areas, but it didn't really resolve the writing issue. Cheryl's an occupational therapist, so when she received a referral for a student uh, with writing challenges, she tended to provide uh, sensory regulation and motor strategies, and those are really important, but it didn't resolve the issue. We realized that when we and our teachers look at students with all four of those windows open, we're going to be much more successful. Uh, we'd like to give you a few examples of what that means. 
to look through those areas. Uh, I'll start with language. There are lots and lots of language things that you can do to help your students be more successful writers. And I'm going to, on purpose, talk with talk with one that's going to make me laugh because I'm doing exactly the wrong thing. One of the first and most important things that you can do to help your reluctant writers is talk less. Okay, I'm saying this as I'm sitting up here just flapping my lips a mile a minute, okay? A lot of our students, our students with executive function learning differences, have a hard time processing lots of language. And when a lot of language comes at them, like I'm doing right now, with all the talking that I'm doing right now, their brains shut down. I'm going to go to the world of autism for a minute and talk about some examples in that world that really <laughs> illustrate it better than I, as Kathy Oler, could illustrate it. There's a woman in the world of autism named Temple Grandin. Some of you may have heard of her. Okay, she is probably the most famous person with autism in the world. And she's, I don't know, 60-ish years old, something like that. She has a PhD. She is brilliant. She's written a bunch of books, and she lectures around the world. And the thing that is amazing is that she has given us a window of what it's like inside the world of autism. What it's like to be a smart person with autism. And you know what? I'm going to underline that word smart. Autism is a huge spectrum disorder. Some of the kids, the ones that are easy to recognize as having autism, don't talk. And don't have a lot of interaction with the world around us. But many of the folks with autism are on the high end of the spectrum and are great talkers and have superior intelligence and are going to be in your classes, probably every one of the classes that you teach, and they may not have a label. There's nothing official that says this person has autism. But they will still have difficulties with social skills, with behaviors, and with communication. The communication is the one I want to talk about right now. They may be great talkers, but what goes in isn't as strong. Even the best talkers in the world of autism are going to have a trouble processing if you're doing what I'm doing and talking a lot. Even a student like Temple Grandin in your class with a superior intelligence, what she says, I've heard her lecture a bunch of times, every single time she says, when you talk to me with lots of words, I listen to three sentences, and then your words go into blah, 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 and I tune you out. Okay, now I didn't do that as mockery. That's the way she describes it. Three sentences, and her brain turns our speech into jargon. Think of what a kid does. Think about what our students on the autism spectrum, even our students that don't have the label but are very high functioning, Think what happens in their brain and their behavior when our speech, when we're doing what I'm doing, when we talk a lot. So one of the strongest things we can do is use visuals whenever possible. Don't just do everything talking like I'm doing today. Have a screen going. Have a list of instructions that might be on the board but also might be on their desk. Have visual supports. Don't just rely on talking. That's one of the most important things that you can do as far as language goes. Talk less. Okay. Um, and from a sensory perspective, sensory is down at the bottom of that pyramid. And when we talk about sensory, it is thought and the research supports that about 70% of our behavior is based on how we process sensory information. And so when I think of sensory as one of those four lenses, I think, gosh, 70% of my behavior what all does, what all does that mean and how can I help my students? Think about yourselves first. Think about when you came into the room today and you navigated around the room, the lighting was okay, temperature seems to be pretty good. You sat down in your chairs, I didn't see anybody fall out of their seat. You knew where your body was in space, that's a sensory component. You probably leaned over, put your purse on the floor, again, didn't fall out of the chair. 
You modulated your voice to have conversation without bothering other people. You probably reached into your purse to grab out your pen or pencil without even looking because you had a good sensory sense of tactile discrimination. So lots of sensory things were happening that you never even thought about doing because you're pretty well neurologically wired and all that sensory information is going in and it's making the right connection and then you make a response to your environment appropriately. But for many of our students, they don't have good sensory integration and their sensory processing uh, skills are very challenged. And so all that information from all of our senses goes in, but sometimes it's faulty information. And then on top of that, it makes incorrect connections. And then we give a incorrect, inappropriate response to our environment. And sometimes some of our students are very dramatic, it appears, in their response. If they are receiving faulty information, and it's not making that connection, I can only respond the way that I internally perceive. And so that's what's gonna happen that perhaps somebody maybe brushed by that student as they were passing their desk and they yell or they push somebody back because they felt like their personal space had been invaded from a tactile point of view, from their tactile system. Um, and so we can go on and on for the, the short amount of time that we have in this block. I want you to realize that on top of our senses that you've learned about for years as a child in school, we also have some other senses that aren't talked about as much. All those senses are involved in everything we do and writing and so forth. But our sense of proprioception is very important and it is where my body is in space. And so it gives me lots of good information about um, where I am in space related to my arm and my torso, but also where I am in relation to another human being or objects in my environment. And so when those proprioceptors, which are housed between my joints that connect muscle and tendon to bone, that when they are fired off, like push and pull and lift and carry types of activities, those fire off those receptors. So it gives me awareness of where my body is in space, it feeds that proprioceptive system, and it also helps to calm and organize my nervous system, which is vital. And so I'm getting to that part because those are some of the strategies that you can help your students to be better sensory regulated. The other area that is not talked in sensory as much is our vestibular system. And vestibular is very, very powerful. It's my equilibrium, my balance, what is upside down, what is right side up, what makes sense of my world gravitationally. It controls both sides of my body working together. One hand is dominant, one is recessive. It helps to control my eyes and my hands working together for reading and for writing. Um, between my proprioceptive and my vestibular system, my muscle tone. And so you see our kiddos who have, it's just hard for them to hold their head and neck up against gravity, let alone now to coordinate my eyes and hands to work together. Um, and so I could go on with some, our more tactile system is involved and really powerful with deep pressure touch. Tactile is, it tells us lots and lots of information from discrimination to pain reception. Um, it, just, it just gives us lots and lots of information. I want to shorten things because we'll run out of time here. Um, but I want you to think about there's even interoreceptors, and, and those are my internal organs that give me information from a sensory perspective. The student who seems to like always have to go to the bathroom, maybe it's an excuse, but maybe that student really has a need and a problem and, and needs to go to the restroom because their bladder feels like it is full when there's just a little bit of urine in their bladder. So we've got all kinds of internal organs that are getting messages as well. So it's a big deal and there's lots of it all going on at once. So I want you just to think about the foundation of how I can help my students. Vestibular is activated with movement with that equilibrium and balance area I was talking about. So when that starting and stopping of movement activates that vestibular system. And so I'm gonna think about as strategies to help my reluctant riders, how I can get more structured movement built into their school day. So here in one part, I've got more active movement, structured, and I also have big, heavy work, big muscle activity for that proprioceptive input. Okay, so we're going to build those kinds of strategies throughout my school day. How can I get my kids up, moving, and their brain is turned on? The other thing I want to point out to you that we're talking sensory right now, but over here indirectly also, is the research is abundant on how movement, exercise, aerobic exercise at target heart rate, how it impacts, guess what, executive functioning area of the brain. It's phenomenal, it's so exciting, and there's so much research out there. And so when I 
activate through aerobic exercise, I'm going to get all the area of the prefrontal cortex and all those executive functioning areas are going to be drenched in these wonderful neurotransmitters. All of the good things that happen that we want for our kids increases and goes up and all the negative goes down, even behavior problems. Attention and focus goes up, memory goes up. And so sometimes we have to work smarter than harder and look at the quality of time that we have to teach and to instruct. And I would said I would rather have 20 minutes of really quality time than 30 minutes of battle. And so if I can take that 10 minutes throughout the day and get my kiddos up and moving, and again, think universal design for what's good for everybody. Okay, and you can go back to an organizational piece there. Right. right, so we've got those four lenses. We've talked about language, we've talked about sensory, and a little bit about motor, and I wanna say something about organization. Organization is the fourth one of these lenses that I want you to think about. Um, about motor too, so. Okay, and more motor is to come. All right, organization. Think about the act of writing. Organization is needed on so many levels. Kids have to be able to organize letters into words. They have to be able to organize words into sentences. They have to be able to organize sentences into paragraphs. Every one of those is difficult for many of our students, many of our reluctant writers, especially those with executive function learning differences. And again, I'm talking general ed as well as special ed kids. I'm not just talking about kids with IEPs. These are kids that will be in your classrooms. So organi organization, what do I do if I know I have a kid with poor organization skills in my classroom? What do I do? Well, there are some high-tech and some low-tech ways that you could address this. High-tech, well, I'm going to start sort of in a spectrum here. Um, do you guys know what graphic organizers are? Yeah, okay, you know those. Okay, those can be so low-tech that you take a pencil and you draw a circle and do the lines out from it. It can be the simplest, fastest thing in the world. You can go on any of a number of websites and get prettier ones, right? And they're free. You can get them for free, any of a number of graphic organizers. Now, before I leave those lower tech things, I want to say I have heard teachers say that they, as soon as kids are writing pretty well, they get rid of the graphic organizers and don't do it anymore. That's a mistake. That's a big mistake. Anytime you find a support that works for a student, what you want to do is you want to use it often enough that you teach that student to internalize it and use it independently without you saying, okay, for this paragraph, we're gonna use a graphic organizer. That's fine for teaching the skill, but you wanna do it often enough that when the student has to write a paragraph, he thinks, oh yeah, I put my main idea here and then my supporting details here, 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 however you use that graphic organizer. Any strategy you use that works, use often. Because for any strategy in teaching, you want it to be internalized. You want that student to be able to do it without you reminding them to do it. That's, that's one of the most important things that we could say here. Do a strategy often enough that a student begins to be able to use it independently. So back to those graphic organizers. The word organizer is right in there because it's a really strong tool for organization. The low-tech ones you can print off from the internet, you can print off from Google Image, you can get it out of a number of workbooks. There are some electronic forms of it through programs. Um, I'm gonna name a few programs that have it. There's one, an older one that's called Kidspiration. That's for ages, developmental ages four through nine. And then the older version of that is called Inspiration. It's for developmental ages nine through high school. Okay, these programs have been out like 20 years. That's why I'm specifically naming those because a lot of school corporations have those programs on all of their computers. Only a lot of them have been there so long that teachers forget they're there. So if you are assigned to a school, check and see if a program for graphic organizers is on all the computers. And if it is, use that program to help your students. Your supervising teacher may have forgotten that it's on that computer. You know, because it's been there 
you know, it's just sort of passed down through generation of computer to generation of computer. But those are two of the good ones. There are lots others, but the point is they're electronic graphic organizers. There's another one called Draft Builder that I personally think is the hardest one, but it's maybe the most valuable one for high school kids. And it electronically helps kids organize into paragraphs and essays and full reports. Okay, you're not going to use it probably for an elementary student. You can, but it's more information than they would need. But if you're teaching at the high school level, that's one to look for and see if maybe your school has it. It's available on iPad, Chrome, and the computer. Okay, now let me go to total low tech for young kids. Have any of you worked with students uh, with terrible handwriting where they don't leave any spaces between their words? Okay, you recognize that as a common issue. If you haven't yet, you will. A lot of our reluctant writers don't leave any spaces between their words. There are lots of reasons for that. But one of the reasons for that is because a lot of kids with ex executive function learning differences, and I'm not saying disabilities, I'm just saying differences, tend to hear uh, sentences as one long word. They don't hear it as discrete chunks of words. You can test that. If you have a kid, especially a child with autism, I say that because I'm an autism consultant, this is where you see it to the most extreme degree. If you have, ask a child with autism, how many words are in the sentence, I go to school every day? You'll hear everything from, I go to school every day, from three to, I go to school every day, nine. There isn't that inherent ability to perceive the words as separate units. So when kids write it, they don't leave spaces between those words. That's one of the reasons. There are a lot of reasons that kids don't leave spaces in there. This is a skill that you as a teacher might have to teach. Now, you probably won't teach this for high school kids, but I've used this strategy up through fifth grade. And will you be my student? Sure. All right. All right, I'm going to demonstrate this. Poor Cheryl's had to be my student on this one a few times. Um, yeah, I know. All right. I'm going to demonstrate this very low-tech strategy. And as I said, I have used it. I didn't think it was good past third grade. I have used it really with pretty amazing success up through fifth grade. But be careful with fourth and fifth grade because it's juvenile looking and you don't want to ever do a strategy that's going to set your student apart from his peers or call negative attention to a student. So keep that as a warning if you're going to thinking of using this for fourth or fifth grader. All right. Cheryl's a student who doesn't leave any spaces between her words. They're just all, you know, that's the sentence and that's 14 words or whatever it is. So I'm going to teach her how to perceive words as separate units. I'm going to hold my hand in front of my face. I'm going to do a bunch of stuff. And then after we've done this, I'll tell you what all I did. But watch this in the meantime. Okay, Cheryl. Yes. <laughs> make up a sentence with the word school. School is a great place to be. I love your sentence, Cheryl. Let's say it together. School, school is, is a, a great, great place, place to, to be. be. Cheryl, that's a wonderful sentence. How many words are in your sentence, Cheryl? Seven. i got to make it so these folks can see over here. Seven <laughs> words in your sentence, Cheryl. Let's do that again. School, school is a great, great place, place to be. Wonderful. I can't believe you made seven words in your sentence. Do it one more time. School is a great place to be. How many words? Seven. Write those seven words and then hold up your hand and I'll come back and check it. Okay. Several things happened there. Thank you, Cheryl. You were excellent at that, as always. Vanna. All right. <laughs> Vanna. <laughs> All right. First place, my hands were right in front of my mouth because I want Cheryl to watch my mouth and my fingers the whole time through that strategy. My fingers obviously are emphasizing, overemphasizing words as separate units, overemphasizing it. It's right in front of my mouth because I'm going to do this strategy three times. First time I'm going to say it with Cheryl, and I'm saying the words right there with her. The second time I'm mouthing the words with her, and if she forgets, I'm going to instantly prompt her with the word. 
I'm not going to wait two or three seconds. I'm going to instantly say the word because I want this to go fast. If it doesn't go fast, it won't work. The third time, she says it without me saying it. It's independent. Sorry, I don't have to I still have my hands in front of my mouth. Sorry, force of habit. Okay, you want to say it three times. You're emphasizing after each time how many words were in your sentence and you're praising. Praising reinforcement is one of the evidence-based practices in the world of autism. You cannot over-reinforce. Reinforcement is valuable, especially for kids who struggle with a skill. You want to make sure they know that they did a really good job on that. Okay, so that emphasized the words as separate units. I'm having her write that, re-emphasizing it's seven words. And then I will check that, I will check what she did immediately. Even if I have to stop working with this kid over here for this task, I'm going to come right to her as soon as her hand's up. Okay, that's a wonderful, low-tech, free way to teach words as discrete units. Would you, I know you were going to talk about something else, but would you talk about the yellow box things? Because it's sort of the same well, thing. And I, yes, I'll it'll lead into talking about motor components. The yellow box and the yellow lines is just connected with motor and visual motor and with Kathy's counting the words as separate units is that I just don't go anywhere without my yellow highlighter. And I have it with me, or I, I leave it someplace and I grab another one, to be honest. I usually leave them in the classroom. But I, wherever I go, I've got my yellow highlighter. And I want to, as we're doing that, how many words were in your sentence? And they say there were six or seven words. Then I'm going to draw those six or seven lines on their paper. So then as they start to write, I've given them words as separate units, spaces to put it on. I've also chunked it down, and now I've made it more concrete that they're just going to write the words. The, the strategy has helped them get their working memory strong enough to develop their sentence and hopefully remember it long enough. I may have another student who still didn't have that. They did it verbally, but they couldn't get it motorically. They couldn't get it out on paper. And I might jot it down for them. And if it's appropriate, I'll have that student go ahead and copy. And all they're doing now is working on letter formation, printing, spacing. But the yellow lines really, really help. We have other kids, motor-wise, that they'll say, oh my gosh, the writing is all over the paper. It's so huge. They cannot write small enough. Sometimes it truly is a visual motor, a visual perceptual problem. Other times, the student is trying to multitask all those layers of writing and something gets lost. I'm trying to get out what my memory has in mind. I'm trying to sound out the word. I'm trying to get my sentence on here. And I just can't get the letters to stay the size I want them to and do it all. So by just bought, drawing a yellow box the size that I want that sentence to get to be fitted into, or sometimes I'll do yellow boxes per word, I'll be amazed at how students bring the writing down to the size and conform to the box. They just didn't know. They just weren't visually tuning in to the lines on the page of a paper. Now, I'm not going to do that for a sixth grade student who's writing a, a big report, but we're looking at different strategies for different kiddos and different problems. So kind of keep that in mind as we go along. Um, the other thing, motor-wise, those of you who think that you're going to be teaching young children and you're really, from the get-go, teaching letter formation, really keep in mind you want to have a very strong motor memory of making letters. And so that we know that there are a lot of differences for some of our folks, particularly with autism, that they don't get those monkey see, monkey do neurons. Um, they're just different in the brain. And so they need a lot more repetition to imitate those motor actions. There aren't as many neural connections between the areas of the brain to store for long-term memory retrieval when I take in that new information. And so when there aren't as many neural connections, I need more and more and more practice to get it. And I need lots of multi-sensory ways to get that foundation. We kind of hit the ground running anymore with the writing process and being creative and just getting your ideas and thoughts down and not worrying about spelling and don't worry about this or that. We just want our kids to like to write. The concern is, to me professionally, is, and for many of us, is that many of our students, visual motor wise and all the sub skills, they're not quite there yet ready when they're very young. So developmentally, it's sometimes like asking a three-year-old to start writing developmentally because they're in a preschool or a kindergarten classroom. And so I need to look at that student's needs. And so I would ask of you, if you are kindergarten teachers, that there are 50 ways or more to make letters and numbers without ever using a pencil or paper to begin with. And to do that pencil paper last, within reason, 
Use the first nine weeks of school to start to develop more of those visual motor activities, the fine motor, gross motor. Your gross motor, your big muscles, help to support little muscles. So I have to have really good strength, upper body strength, neck, shoulders, and everything to have good fine motor control. So you're gonna be off and riding very quickly. So it's worth the time to do activities that incorporate and encourage big muscle activity, all the fun gross motor play that you do with classes and children. It's not just play. And I shouldn't say the word just play because play is a child's job. That is their occupation, but how you can integrate that into the learning process. So if you're a teacher teaching young and you're doing letter formation, take the time to build that motor memory. So they're not back there trying to remember how to make a letter, but they're able to, oh, got this. I know how the letter looks. I got to remember what the sound is and then how to sound out my word. But I'm still back here trying to find the word on the word wall um, or the letter on the alphabet strip. It's going to be a lot tougher for the, ch the child. Research also supports that that auditory piece that you say out loud and the student says, a big line down, you know, uh, back up and around, whatever it is that they're saying auditorially, they're saying verbally that you've taught them and they're listening auditorily, that research supports that that helps them remember how to form the letters. Teach explicitly, offer multi-sensory ways, whether it's sand, it's shaving cream. There's so many different ways, a little tray of salt, whatever it is that helps them just to get the motor memory made before you go to where I'm putting it on a piece of paper and holding the pencil. Um, when I look at my students as they start to get a little bit older, I start to look at, I want my kids to love to write. And again, school moves really, really quick. So you're not going to just offer one tool, but to offer multiple tools. So you have that opportunity to say, um, do you want to use a gel pen? Do you want to use a pencil grip on your pencil? Uh, would you rather use a pen with erasable ink? Whatever it is that, that is good for them. Let them get the feel of the tool. But I'm still going to offer another tool and say, when do I introduce technology? When do I want to offer keyboarding opportunities for many students? We know that all students, again, think universal design. In our district, we have all Chromebooks. And all students by third grade on up have access to a Chromebook. And the technology we have available now is tremendous. But I would also say to you that look at, if I have very dysfunctional handwriting, I'm going to still use that dysfunctional handwriting faster than if I'm not familiar where letters are on a keyboard and it takes me more time. Or you see a lot of your kiddos that will hunt and peck with just one hand. Even if they're hunting and pecking, make sure they got both hands on that keyboard and they get in the habit. Keyboarding programs can start as early. They'll start them even in first grade kindergarten. I think professionally as far as from an OT that about third grade the hand span of a third grader developmentally fits home row keys and the maturity of following home row keys and really learning how to type. You can do it earlier in second grade. Some, I'm not going to say there aren't some second graders that are maybe awesome right, typers, um, but just trying to look at developmentally. So a handwriting without tears, I know starts there. They have keyboarding without tears. Handwriting without tears is a printing and cursive program. It's phenomenal. It's great. There's lots of them out there. I happen to like that one. Um, they also have keyboarding without tears, but there are lots of programs out there. But I do encourage you, if you're working with students, um, second, third grade, to have opportunities for keyboarding practice so they can really make use of, that, of those tools as well. Then I also want to talk about when we look at the motor area, Kathy talked a little bit about technology. If you're not familiar with the program Read and Write Gold for Google and you have access to Google extensions, it's a phenomenal program. You as teachers can get a free premium version of it. And if you do a Google search and just say Read and Write Gold for Google, uh, teacher free, free access, you will see it. Teachers get a pre uh, pre, a free premium version of it. Students, your, your kids that you're teaching and or US students can get a 30 day trial of it and then you get to te keep the uh, text to speech component of it. And Read and Write for Google has on it word prediction. So think about your struggling spellers. Think about your kids with slow processing speed, executive functioning again, that slow processing speed that when I can hit a couple letters for a word and see word choices pop up and click on that word, it's going to keep that writing process and creating those sentences much quicker when my processing speed is so slow. So whether it's a student with a learning disability um, or autism or 
whatever, or just for a student who just says, this helps me so much more than me just trying to type out every letter and word. So word prediction is incredibly powerful. Being able to be able to talk to the computer, to have voice typing and voice recognition is a, a Google free extension within those uh, programs. And so if I brainstorm to the computer, I can talk out everything. My working memory, again, executive functioning, is there on the, on the screen. I can clean it up. I can, I can take what I want out of it, but at least everything I wanted to say is there once I've supported with that visual representation, a picture, a drawing, something that's supporting my writing. And so again, with the motor component of that, whether I'm talking to the computer or whether I'm listening back to what the computer is telling me what I wrote, our kids love to hear back what they wrote from the computer screen. And they want you to come over and listen to it. Come on over, come listen to what I wrote. They get very excited about it. And they will write more because they want to hear it talk more. I love that some kids will say, you know what, they realize they just said, I like 15 times in their writing because they sat back and listened. And so another student said, you know what, she just keeps talking and talking and talking. She doesn't stop. And we said, well, why do you think that is? No punctuation. You left no punctuation. And so then they were able to go back and put in the punctuation. And so the power that, you know, the research again supports that everyone benefits from proofreading whatever they've written. Seldom do many of our kids do it to the extent that they should. So, but if I can sit back and listen to it, or I could trade uh, writings and auditorially just listen, I might get a bigger buy-in and I might even correct what my work is. So Read and Write Gold has word prediction, it has text-to-speech, speech-to-text, it has vocabulary builder. So think about when you're writing vocab words and you sit there and you write the word on the index card and you turn it over and you try to write that whole definition out. The students that we support frequently can't read what they wrote and what was the purpose of this writing task? Why, did, why are we supposed to be doing this? to learn the definition of these words. Well, let's get down to it. Vocabulary Builder in Read and Write Gold builds, takes all those words, puts them in a table by just clicking, gives you a picture of the word and the definition, and will read it to the student if that student needs it. It's, it's so powerful. So there's so many things this program does. It even has for your older students um, an extension called Equatio, and it has all kinds of math digitally and the equations and convert, it's just phenomenal. So I encourage you to get the free version get, if you get an opportunity. Um, there's lots of technology. The other piece I'd just like to mention is um, DocHub. It converts PDFs, documents, so that, that you can type on the document. So any student who you have a worksheet that they're, again, motor challenges are just too intense and they need more support, they can use that worksheet. Um, it will convert it and then they can type on the worksheet. Another program is called SnapType, and it is for iPad. It was developed by an occupational therapy student who's now an OT, and she was, worked with a developer. She had an excellent idea. She had many students and who were struggling just like the kids that we are talking about today. You take a picture with your iPad of the worksheet, and then when you double tap on anywhere where there's a response line, then the, your text box opens with your on-screen keyboard, and they can type their answers on the worksheet. So t uh, parents could use um, snap type at home for homework sheets and then just email it to the teacher. It's got a lot of power. Again, think about what is the purpose of the excitement of uh, the uh, assignment and how can I best get out my students' knowledge. Okay. And snap type, as Cheryl said, is an iPad app. I wanted to say a little bit more about iPads. A lot of the schools that you're going to be teaching in will have iPads available for students. And these can be one of the most valuable assistive tools that you'll have at your fingertips. Something that breaks my heart is when I go into a classroom and I ask teachers, what do you use your iPad for? And they say, oh, kids can play on it when they finish their work. That is an absolute terrible thing to do with an iPad in a school. For after school or for recess, that's fine. But in the school, used appropriately, an iPad can almost be like having an instructional assistant at your fingertips right there. You can find iPad apps to support almost anything that you're teaching, and kids love using them. You can set up a group, a station, or a group of kids, and they can pass one iPad around this test, that circle, taking turns organizing words into sentences, if that's what you're working on, or creating paragraphs, if that's what you're working on, or putting punctuation into sentences, if that's what you're working on. Use the iPads 
educationally. They can be just incredible tools. Don't fall into the trap of just using them as a toy. Because that's, then it is just a toy. You might as well go get a Fisher Price kind of thing. And I'm not saying that disparagingly. But the iPad can be so, so valuable for you as students. There are pro iPad apps for practicing for young children, for practicing letter formation. There are iPad apps for third, fourth, fifth, up through middle school for making presentations where you turn the iPad into a whiteboard. And the students who hate to write can create their whole presentation on the whiteboard. There's one called a poplet. There are a few of them, but that's one of them. There's a free version of it. They can create their presentation on the iPad, project it for their peers. There you go. We have Indiana State standards from, and I said this earlier today, I think it's fourth grade on. Student will use technology to to present information to peers, to inform, to persuade, or to, I always forget the third thing, narrate or something like that. It's a state standard from like fourth grade up through twelfth grade. Kids have to use technology to prepare presentations for our kids who hate to write. That is like a death knell. It's something that's very, very difficult. Teach them how to do it with an iPad and it's a win-win situation. So. Technology can be your friend, but it also can be terribly abused. So anyway, on our website, the I Hate to Write, we have a website, IHateToWrite.com. And on there, I think we have the list of my favorite iPad apps for education. Okay. So take a look and see if there's anything. It's also my opinion, so you may disagree with some of them. But take a look at those and see if there's anything that you think would be valuable for the students that you're working with. We also have an I Hate to Write Facebook page, so if you like us, we like to try to post different various websites, articles, and different things, and references and resources for you. Um, uh, and I try to update it pretty regularly. Sometimes we get a little busy on our, uh, our day jobs. Um, also, thinking about back just for a moment on, I want you to make sure that you understand too, when we were hearing today through um, our conversations and so forth, of a lot of times of students having difficulty paying attention, getting focused, sitting still, um, getting you know their head in the game. And I want you to go back again and think about working with that whole child. What can I do with that child? And go back and think about, could I provide aerobic exercise? Could I get that student up and moving? Okay, and don't just think that child. Sometimes I will take a student and say, you know what, I'm going to have them go take the message down to the hallway, down to the teacher who knows they're coming. I don't know what the message says, but they come every day right before writing because I want them out, I want them moving, I want them going. And then I may ask him to come back in the classroom and, you know, wipe out the dry erase board for me, hand out the books, whatever it is, something else that is a big muscle activity. Maybe I have him do some wall push-ups. <coughs> But again, I'd rather start first with universal design and what could I have my whole class do for that? Five minutes. There's a great website for younger kids from like K preschool through sixth grade. I'd almost do it in junior high because I think some of the kids have a lot of fun with it. And it's called um, Move to Learn. And it's move to learn ms.org. It's a free site. He's a, a, a PE teacher, teacher from Mississippi. And he's just really great. He's in the classroom with the kids. He brings them up. He gets their heart rate up for about five minutes, 30 seconds. Then he brings them da back down and a little bit of, you know, calming at the end. And all the songs and music are related to something educational and fun and engaging. The choreography is, is good enough to get your heart rate up, but it's also not so fast that some of our kids kids who have those motor planning problems that they can't participate. Okay, so it's really, really good. And sometimes I may still have one of my students who are just standing there and it's like, wow, you need it the most. Why aren't you moving? And sometimes, you know, I think, well, what do we do when we have a video on the screen? You watch a video, right? And I think for some of our kids, that's what they perceive that they're supposed to do, watch the video. Um, and so other times it's that the motor planning is happening still too quick for them. So I'll say, just march. Just clap your hands. Just dance. Do whatever you want. And if that still isn't enough for that special student that needs that extra 
more boost of movement, I'll, I may have them do the extra job, the extra activities, and look at what can I do outside of the classroom if I need to. Maybe the janitor or the custodians need some support in the cafeteria of wiping off the tables. Maybe the librarian needs some help with the books being returned. I was so excited one day when I saw a class that was doing recycling, and they had the uh, big thing of the trash can to recycle. It's like, oh my gosh, I've got four kids that I need to see if they can get jobs with you um, throughout the day. So there's so many things. You just look in your environment. For my older and high school kiddos again there's all kinds of jobs around the high schools older kids like competition and so doing in a classroom doing boot camp kinds of stations and how you know somebody beating out the other person they like those kinds of activities so find things that work for your class one class went out and they they walked the track before it was writing time I had another sixth grade teacher who said, you know, um, I really want to try this more. Um, and she did a 20 minute walk right before, act for them it was math, it wasn't even writing. That was her hardest subject that she was finding they were missing out on. I said, you know, I so appreciate you taking the time to do this, that if you want them to talk math facts and you want to have academic conversation, you could do that while they're walking. And she said, you know, they're sixth graders and I think they just need time to be social and talk to each other. And so she let them do that, which I totally respected. So find what works. She had really nice, nice responses. And there's a, if you want research to support why you're doing this or why you're spending time in your classroom, write us, we will be glad to share. I wanna encourage you to look up um, Dr. John Rady, it's R-A-T-E-Y. He wrote the book called Spark. And what he found was that um, he had colleagues that were having some problems, and these were professionals like uh, doctors, psychiatrists, and so forth. He's a psychiatrist from Harvard, and he was finding that they were getting very cloudy in their thinking, and they were saying, I'm just not as sharp, I'm, I'm not as focused, my memory isn't as good as it was, and so on. And he started making this correlation, and with this group of colleagues, what they found was they were all runners, and they had all had sports injuries, and they weren't getting their medicine. And he will talk about that exercise at an aerobic level of getting that heart rate up is like taking a little bit of Prozac and a little bit of Ritalin because it drenches the prefrontal cortex, that executive functioning area, and the, all of those good things we were talking about earlier. So um, he went, he, then more and more research, Naperville, Illinois has some great, uh, some uh, video if you get a chance. They, at the high school there, um, they took all the PE classes. Nobody's sitting around standing waiting for a turn at a station. All the kids had heart monitors. They increased the exercise and everything right before the academics, so right before writing, right before reading. And when they increased this aerobic exercise, and that was all they had changed, that all the standardized test scores went up, and it was the same students that the test scores went up on that the kids had the highest fitness scores. The highest fitness scores came if they kept their heart rate up during PE. And so I encourage you that I think sometimes our students need medication. Um, I'm not going to say there aren't children who can benefit from that, but as a occupational therapist, and I think all of us want to make sure to see what can we do first holistically and see what can we offer. And maybe a student may still, still need medication, but maybe they may need less or maybe they don't need it at all. So first to really try to see what have you done environmentally for your kids um, before we're saying, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do with him. He won't sit still, he can't pay attention. Um, he may have some real chemical imbalances, but he may also need some really good structured aerobic exercise. So do you want to add? No, um, I just want to know if any of you have questions. Yeah. So we're talk, talk, talk. We talked about what we were going to do during this super session and try, we said the highlight was the idea of what our, our day was and what tomorrow is and put it in this, this little nutshell. Um, and we said, we'll make it very interactive. And then we find, gosh, we've got so much we want to share before we get interactive. So we'd like to have some conversation with all of you. What are you finding as challenges right now? Um, what, what's your biggest challenge? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> my biggest challenge, particularly for my students who have an IEP, is that I want to enforce the fact that my standards stay the same for you, and I'm pushing you to the same mm -hmm. exercise I would in other students while still being able to adhere to their individual needs yeah. while taking care of the rest of my classroom. Because it is really um, tempting to like hold their hand more than they really need, because sure. it's a lot more work for you when you don't. So yeah. You have to, like, constantly reinforce like no don't do it for them just because it's easier for you or help them so I think I have trouble balancing saying you're as good as 
you can do anything anyone else can while still being sensitive to their individual needs as far as what's making them struggle or having issues. Sure. Absolutely. Let me repeat this for the people who are no. listening online, because yes. apparently the oh, people sorry. listening online, no, apparently we have to do that. The people who are listening online won't be able to hear your questions from out here. So I'm going to summarize that, and if I miss out some of the important points, fill it in, and I'll fill it in for the people who are listening. But this teacher is wondering how you balance that, find that magic balance between providing enough support for the students who have the IEPs and have accommodations and allowances and supports through the IEPs with the rest of the students who may not have those supports without becoming, um, um, What's the word? Without providing too much support, I'm sorry, I can't think of the word I'm looking for so right now. Want to uh, like or without becoming a crutch. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Without becoming a crutch, how do you make that balance? Provide enough support, but not too much support, and build those independent skills. Does that sort of? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Do you think? Um, I, I I always go I like to go back again to universal design. And so some things are accommodations for students. Hold on a second. Do you guys know what universal design is? Okay. Okay, that means providing supports that are good for all kids, yeah. not just the kids with the IEPs. Okay, sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, no. And, ju and just looking at that, so what is, you know, some things are accommodations and some students don't need that. But how I can first look at what is just best practices in teaching and how I can make great strategies for all my students and then be able to differentiate enough that we're all different learners. Everyone sitting here is a different learner. Some of you right now would probably like to lay down on the floor. Somebody else would like to go stand up. But, you know, we all need some flexible seating options, what kind of tool we want to use and so on. So just trying to look at it from that perspective first and see if you have put in, have you increased the use of visuals for your whole class? would be an example. You know, I've got a personal schedule uh, for this student, but maybe I just, it would have been enough just to have a whole schedule for my whole class to follow. Um, have I, when I've given uh, verbal instructions, could I do it on the Duquesne so that instructions are bulleted and they all can see them and my words haven't disappeared in outer space, but every student can refer back to them. And so start to look at those kinds of strategies and then see if it doesn't, if you don't notice that, oh, I didn't have to do as much for him. And it didn't mean that you had to do it for everybody, but more it was just a good teaching strategy that helped all students. Okay. Good. Perfect answer. Okay. Another question over here? Yeah. Uh, mine is a little odd. I'm working with pre-K right now, and I think the area I find difficult is the students who need that extra, that lovey, you know, their stuffed animal. Mm -hmm. How I have a hard time saying, okay, I understand that you don't have an IEP, but I know something's going on. Yep. You need this extra five minutes. And then still looking at the other students who want also to play with their stuffed animal, and I have to tell them no. And for them to look at me and say, well, why did they get it and I don't? Yeah. I think I have a hard time with that too because I can understand as an adult and as a teacher looking at them, but at the same time, it, how do I look at another student and say, sorry, your needs or whatever is going on with you right now is not as important as what's going on with that student at this moment. That's what I struggle with. What you have thought? Yeah, well, that's, that's a hard call, and it's not just a hard call in pre-K, it's a hard call through high school, because every student is going to learn differently and have different needs, and it's something that all of us as educators fight with all the time, and we just have to convince ourselves that that's okay for, for different kids to have different needs, and you are in the perfect location and the perfect time in their lives to begin imprinting that, that we all learn differently, everybody's special. There are a lot of programs that deal with that. Everybody counts, everybody's special. There's several programs, but you don't really need a program. It's part of what we need to do in education from the very beginning is reinforce to our students that everybody has their own way of learning. And that's okay. Remember, several years ago, there was the um, uh, the different world, the different af effective learners. There was the art learner, and there was the math learner, and there was the social learner, and that sort of thing. That was another program. Every year, it seems like there's a different one that emphasizes to kids we don't don't all learn the same way. So. Yes, you'll probably have to deal with that every couple of days, but do it from the very beginning. And as a preschool teacher, God bless you, because the ki lessons that the kids are going to learn then are going to benefit all of us through high school, well, through adulthood. We all have different needs. And I think at preschool, 
it's easier when we talk to a, a fifth grader and explain that not everybody needs to have a wiggle cushion to sit on. We only, we, not everybody needs glasses. We get what we need, not always what we just want. Uh, but it's harder as a preschool student to understand that. And so I would also encourage you just to kind of look at, at your lessons of at your day, of what that looks like, and how you can integrate. Because my heart goes there first that they're preschool. Well, they all want their little stuffed animal and they want to play because, again, that's their job is to play. And so how you can integrate that, those tools, those activities, instead of, you know, pick your battles. Instead, how can you increase your lesson plans to integrate those types of things? I think some Sometimes that we expect our kids developmentally to do more than what they are ready to do. And I'm not inferring that you are doing that at all. But I'm just saying that they're preschoolers and you still have lesson plans and an agenda. And yet at the same time, some of the most valuable things they can do is doing play and gross and fine motor activities and hands-on just experiences. So if, if you can feed it in there and kind of work it into the equation, all the better. Um, and I think that that can make a huge difference. And I think sometimes even we can sell our kids short a little bit. Uh, there are some kids that will understand that Johnny's kind of sad today, and so he needs to hold his animal. And I can see four-year-olds understanding that, or three-year-olds sometimes too. So, yeah, but yeah, yeah. God bless you, because it's. I love the age, but it's. Yeah, you got a challenge, right? Yeah. Anybody else have a question? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I'm in a fourth-grade classroom, and my teachers really did not do a lot of writing workshops. Mm -hmm. so the kids have and we always start at the beginning of the week with a graphic organizer. So first we go from Good. the organizer to actually writing a piece of writing. A lot of the kids can fill out the organizer and they can decide how they're going to organize their writing, but then they really struggle taking it from the, organi from the organizer and actually going and writing it. Do you have suggestions for how to get from the organizer to the writing? There's one very concrete what are we thing. The question? Oh, yeah. Uh, this teacher asked about uh, her supervising teacher, yeah. cooperating yeah. teacher, um, has been to several writing workshops that have emphasized the value of using graphic organizers as a writing strategy, which is wonderful, by the way. But the students that this um, teacher is asking about have difficulty moving from the graphic organizer to a less structured form of writing, to go ahead and putting it into a paragraph or whatever they're supposed to be writing. Did I yes. accurately translate that to the people who are listening on the podcast? Um, one very graphic way, very concrete way, and I think concrete because I work in the world of autism a lot, but you can have the students specifically number each one of those pieces of the um, graphic organizer, each leg of the graphic organizer or each step, and have them write them sequentially. And that will give one flow. They can go ahead, you make a sentence with number one, a sentence with number two, a sentence with number three, that sort of thing. If you want to expand it more than that, you can put a star after each one of the, the numbers. So they write a sentence with this word and one more sentence. Then they go to number two a sentence with number two, and then one more sentence. Go to number three, a sentence with this, and then one more sentence. That will teach some, that will require some teaching. Or you may get non-topic related sentences. But that's a way you can move to expand the writing that they have on their graphic organizer. There are several ways. You don't have to use a star. You can use A and B if that is an organization system that the student will understand. Um, or sentence descriptor or whatever word works at your grade level. But that's a way, very concrete, mm -hmm. that you could help students translate that from the graph into writing. There's a, a program, Kidspiration. Did we talk, we, I'm getting that our, our date. Did we talk about Kidspiration? This, yeah. Kidspiration will be the one to. that um, for the younger kiddos. And that Kidspiration, because what it does is take that graphic organizer, whatever <laughs> phrases, whatever words, even if they wrote a whole sentence in the graphic organizer, and they click on one button, it turns it into the next the outline form now. So each of those sentences are in order. So they've got their beginning topic sentence ready to write and the, it'll separate it out real nice. And I think the students love it because then they're not really having to rewrite anything all over right. again too. So, yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, uh-huh. Um, when I was in third grade, I did see a really cool idea for a graphic organizer. Um, it's very visual, it's not really a graphic organizer, 
hamburger, mm -hmm. they would have you do like your topic was the top bun, and then each detail was the piece of yes. that hamburger. Yes. So maybe that'd be a yes. cute way for your kids to for you to look at. Okay, you've got the cheese. Now you're missing mm -hmm. the lettuce. Yep. And then you look at the graphic organizer. That was your lettuce piece. That. When, once they brought that in, the kids like could not. No, stop they love that. Yeah, yeah. So we actually have that one in our book. Yeah, uh, I and, and, and if you have a that. if you have a student who has like a really high interest, whether it's dinosaurs or vehicles or superheroes, right now there are abundance. If you just do a search, and you'll come up with graphic organizers with that theme in the background, and it helps also for their organization. Yeah, I saw a hand up somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did the same session message with my yeah. uh, senior composition. Yep. So, that it works really so this gal said that she used the sandwich graphic organizer with her senior composition class. Amazing. Which underscores the fact that age does not determine when you should stop using graphic organizers. We use graphic organizers as adults. So don't throw away a strategy just because you think a child doesn't need it anymore. And remember, many of our students have difficulty with sequential thought, and that's what that graphic organizer is helping them support to do. Um, there's a, re a resource, don't, don't, or ditch that textbook um, if you put in a search, and he has a lot of graphic organizers that are available. They're really nice, nice ones as well, too. So graphic organizers, I was very surprised, and it's been some years ago, that when I talked to a teacher about it, she didn't know what graphic organizers were. And I was so very, very surprised. Um, and so it was kind of eye-opening to me that sometimes we assume, so we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're covering it all. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so I'm in kindergarten, and our writing is obviously still like pictorial writing. It's not actually writing words. They're all labeled. But, yeah, that's okay. Um, I have one student who, I don't even know why he hates writing. Like this, we just started this obviously at the beginning of the year, but he will like actually get violent when it, it's time to write. And I don't know if he has any like learning differences or anything mm -hmm. like that because it's really early in the year, obviously. Do you have any advice for helping him kind of like cope with that anger? Well, you know, again, make let sure me repeat the question. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this, this teacher works at the kindergarten level, and she has a student who hates to write so much that he becomes violent when he's faced with a writing task, absolutely refuses to write, and asks if we have any suggestions for that. Did I accurately? Okay, now you can talk, Cheryl. Well, I, I think I, I want more information about him, and I know you don't know yet. So I mean, I'm going to always start again universal design of, for my whole class. What is the class doing right before that writing prompt? And what kind of movement, what kind of exercise, what kind of prefrontal cortex drenching of all that good stuff is happening to get him more sensory regulated, more ready for the writing process, and then to be able to handle his frustrations more for whatever reason in that writing that's happening. Then also to look at, is he, is he able to make letters? Is he able to sound out any words? Is he able to draw a picture? You know, where is he in the pre-writing process? Because remember when you preschool teaching, our teachers are involved, that you're looking at pre-writing strokes, those diagonal lines, the X's, the crosses, the triangles, the squares, all of those things are precursors because it's putting part to whole for forming letters, okay? And so if I don't have a good foundation of being able to do those isolated pieces to do part to whole, I'm going to have a hard time with letter formation. Um, how does he hold his pencil? You know, many of our kids are still immature. Is it uncomfortable to him and he doesn't know how to do it? There's, there's just a lot of little pieces. I would encourage you to play detective and see if you can watch him. Is it only during this time of the day that the writing is going on and how he's behaving? Or is it every time they have to do anything that involves a pencil or a crayon or scissor cutting or whatever it is that's happening? And all else fails, could his writing be a picture? Could he draw a picture of something that's really preferred? And I would always encourage you that, you know, we so often write, draw a picture after a writing activity is done. If you get all done, you get to draw a picture. No, have the students draw the picture prior to the writing, because when they draw the picture, their working memory is there. They may add more information, so be sure and, and add that component to it. Okay. Does that help a little? I wish I had more information, but, but again, there's some piece there of why he's shutting down, of whether he doesn't understand, or, or it's too vast what they want him to do, show him visually, show him that he only has to do this much, give him a, a qu quantity that he has to do 
a little quantity <laughs> and then celebrate it, have a party. I always say you just want to celebrate every little piece of positiveness that your students give you. Anything else? Another question? Alisa, have any questions come in from the online audience? <clears throat> And did you say how old he was? Uh, how old? No. Okay. Okay. That that. <laughs> okay. So for a while he was taking some laps second around. Grade. Second grade. Okay. So for a while he was taking some laps around the building and it was helping. And now he's back to the same old, same old. So trying to relook at your primary plan there and saying, okay, this kind of movement wasn't helping. So maybe the laps weren't enough, or he accommodated to it. And looking at some other big physical, big muscle activity and combine it with the structured movement and the big muscle, meaning that push, that pull, that lift and carry types of tasks before he starts. And then he's back to the same old thing. I'm wondering again what, where that other component of the writing is, the, where the breakdown is. Because it makes me think that, wow, he just had movement and everything came together. He was producing. So, and I would get his input. What does he like to do? What would he like to do? He'd rather have a job that he helped the teacher with something that required some big muscle to work with and wipe off the dry erase board or be the paper passer outer or whatever it is? Or would he rather be taking the message down to the office that needs the, the lunch menu needs to go down or the breakfast or the attendance count, something like that? So give him a little bit of options of some new jobs to do. Did you want to add anything? Well, I was just going to say, uh, always pick your battles. Always pick your battles. And if a child has been doing a task for a long time, maybe he's just flat out bored with it. You know, pick your battles. If you can teach the same thing in a different way or chunked differently, you both may win. Mm -hmm. Be flexible in your own thinking as well as in your child's thinking. And think about, you know, you, we can't always just teach about in a preferred favorite thing that I love to talk about and write about and spend all my life doing, but you can teach a lot of chunk down skills in the writing process through that. So it, it's, you know, latch into something that he's really excited about and he really wants to write about and then expand from there, okay? So I can teach punctuation, I can teach, you know, capitalization, I can teach descriptive writing all on dinosaurs or whatever it is. So do you guys, when you are doing and you are in the classroom with your students, are you finding that, I'm curious of what kind of technology you have available to you right now, those who are using technology. How many of you use Chromebooks or available Chromebooks? Okay. So there are about six or seven people holding okay. up their hands. How many use iPads? There are about mm -hmm. 12 okay. people holding up their hands. Do you others have laptops or PCs in the classroom? Okay, so they are available for the students. And so that's an option. So again, it's not that I'm not gonna do my work, but would I rather do it pencil paper or would I rather do it auditorily to you or would I rather do it on a keyboard that I have options and choices? Okay, sometimes I might wanna sit and write a short period, something small, but I know that if I'm tired and it's in the afternoon, I've got a lot to write, I'm gonna pick a keyboard. And so, you know, give our kids choices as well. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. I have one other question I just thought of. Um, okay, so I'm student teaching next semester, and for our spelling tests every week, I'm in fourth grade. Um, so for spelling tests every week, we've tra just transitioned from paper, pencil, just writing out your words, to my teacher prefers um, doing dictation sentences. So she'll record a whole sentence that has that one spelling word in that sentence, but they're responsible for writing the whole sentence out. Um, and I have actually a couple of boys who struggle with auditory processing. So for them, it's a huge struggle because there are no words on the screen. They click play and they hear the sentence. Um, and so I'm just wondering, because I don't want to step on her toes. I'm right. A teacher, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering what we can do or maybe what I can suggest to help those two boys who do have auditory processing. 
I mean, they struggle with it. Absolutely. They need wow. They auditory. They need visual reinforcement, which she does a great job of in all other areas. But when you're graded on a spelling test and you can only hear the words and you don't see anything, they're right. really struggling with that. Right. And that's the purpose of the, of the, of the writing task right. is the spelling word, right. is how to spell that word. Yes. And I'm, I'm sure she wants to, them to have that connection of how to use it in content in a <laughs> sentence and make sure they're getting the right word as well. And so what, have you tried anything at all? Have, have you, have, or you haven't? No, just because I don't want to, I mean, that's the way she likes it. That's how she does it. Will she allow the yellow lines, one for each word? Probably. That might be, that might be a way you could support the student without offending the teacher. Mm -hmm. And that's important. You don't want to offend your supervising teacher, not just yeah. because of political reasons. You don't want to offend any colleague. Mm -hmm. But you might try, hold on just one second, just to differentiate the fact that that sentence that the boys are hearing mm -hmm. is made up of separate units of words, discrete units. They won't know the word discrete, right. but you know. Right. Okay, just draw each of those lines with some space between, and it will help add a visual to the auditory component. Because right now they're only getting the auditory component and with an auditory processing a difficulty, that's setting them at a huge disadvantage. So if you can just add the visual component with the yellow lines, that's, a, that's something to try. And then if, the, if that's not enough, then to go ahead and say if the purpose is that they have to know how to, they're being tested on that spelling word, then if you can go ahead with her permission, go ahead and write the sentence and leave the spelling word blank with the yellow line and then let them just fill that in. Because that's really the gut. I always say, what is this writing task? What's the bottom What's line? The Why do we, yep, exactly, exactly. And so you're just visually giving them the rest of the sentence. It's just reconfirming. And I, I would think that she would probably be fine with that. So, yeah. Okay, good, good question. Okay. I have a, have a, a thought. I yeah. was thinking that, and we're getting close to closing time anyway, but in case there's one more question or whatever, why don't we take our qu short little brain break that you like and let them I just have, them have the opportunity break. so they have a strategy. I know you do. That's why I want to do it. So we're going to do a little brain break because I love I already it. did it I like, today. I know, but you're so good at it. You get to do it again. Um, awesome. Just so you'll have a strategy. In preschool, it's too old for them. I appreciate, I apologize for that. But for it's fun and it'll get your brain juices going. So we're gonna do a short little brain break. And what happens when you do a brain break is that you've been thinking, you've been concentrating, you're trying to keep it all here, and you just need to let it go. Just relax, have fun. And as you laugh, it increases those neurotransmitters. It helps memory, it ha helps learning. So it's a win-win situation. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Our kids come in with huge stresses and anxiety and it's getting, all that learning is getting blocked. So we want to release it at some point, many times throughout the day. So it's called one, two, three, if you've never done it before. And so I'm gonna say one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. Three. Okay. I'm really good at that so part. Gonna, yeah. So we're going to get the get it, and we want movement. And did you know that by we stand up, we increase our our brain power by seven percent. Our brain turns on just because I stood up. How powerful is that? So we were going to do one, two, three, which you will do with your partner, and then I'll say freeze after about four or five rounds because I think you can get this. And then I'm going to take one away as words, and I'm going to say two, three, two, three, two, three, two. Three. You get the idea. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> so you get the idea. So one was clap, okay? And then I'm going to let you do that for a moment. So no talking for one, just clap, whoever does back and forth. Then I'm going to say free. <laughs> then I'm going to say freeze. And so one was clap, and now two is whoo, okay? So watch. This is when it gets really funny. Okay. Woo! Three. Woo! Three. Woo! Three. <laughs> Three. And then if you really want your class to go to town, and you know what, your preschoolers could do this, and they'll just jump around and clap and have fun anyway, so it doesn't matter. And the third one I could do is clap, woo, and then give a jump, okay? And then there would be no talking. So you're gonna stand, you'll have your, your, you'll have your shoulder partner, and just go back and forth for a moment. One, two, three. Everyone stand, find a partner, okay? Okay, and ready, and just go back and forth. One, two, three. And ready, go. Just count. One, two, three. Okay, and 
freeze? Freeze, you guys are really good at counting. I like it, I like it. Okay, now one is quiet. You just clap, whoever has one. Just go back and forth. One is just a clap, then two, three. Two, three. Okay, let's make it even more fun. Okay, so one is clap, two is woo, and then three. Woo, three, go. close with go ahead and do the jump just for fun just for kick so you're gonna so there's really no talking except that you're laughing one is just woo jump okay woo okay back and forth <laughs> okay I will I'll put you out of your misery. You guys are awesome. Have a seat for just a moment. <laughs> okay. You guys did really good. You did a great job. Okay. Yeah. So as your brain woke up just a little bit, you had a release of all that concentration. So think about your kids. Yeah. Just don't think about it one time throughout the day, but think about how you're going to feed these things and integrate them into your classroom on a regular basis. Now, as you guys wanted to, you kind of wanted to talk a little bit because you're, you're fired up a little bit more. You're more energetic. And so that's good. I want my kids having all that. But now I also, I may need to lower my lights. I may need to go back to a little bit of deep breathing, get them a little calmer and ready to transition back into the next explicit behavior that I want to teach them for the learning opportunity they're going to get ready for, for you awesome teachers. So um, and I think we're almost at our closing time. Did you want to add anything? Nope. Okay. I uh, thank you all again for coming at the end of a busy day and for sitting here as such an attentive audience. It's you been a pleasure. Join us tomorrow for another day of fun. Come on over. We'll be here. <laughs> thank you guys so much. You've been great. Thanks so much. <laughs>